Also known as the Avino hypothesis. start to survey these different adenohypothesial hormones, they get grouped into families based off of typically structural similarities rather than their functional similarities. So we need to keep this idea in mind that it's structural versus uh, uh, it's functional. So it's not it's not functional, it's structural. And so, uh, for example, we're going to get to a hormone group that's the insulin-like growth factors. And so you think, oh, insulin must be similar to um, must be similar to insulin. And actually, this is a terrible example because these aren't really you know hypothesial hormones, but hormone families. Insulin-like growth factor the factors are insulin-like molecules that don't have insulin-like function. So structure versus function. Um, we're going to start out. We're going to just refer to these as families one through one through three. And our first family, family number one, are the growth hormone prolactin. So these are similar in their structure. Functionally, though, growth hormone regulates growth, and prolactin regulates lactation. Okay, so that's family number one, growth hormone in the prolactin family. Family number two. Glycoprotein hormones. Glycoprotein hormones. Uh, so this is going to include a couple different hormones. The first is the thyrotropin. Thyrotropins. Specifically, we have thyroid stimulating. TSH. So the thyrotropins are the hormones that are produced by the thyrotropes. The thyrotropes are the interpituitary cells that respond to thyrotropin releasing hormone being uh, released from the hypothalamus. Okay. The specific thyrotropin that we have is thyroid stimulating hormone. So the thyrotropes produce a hormone called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, that clearly goes and stimulates the thyroid. So this is one of our glycoproteins. The second glycoprotein is follicle stimulating hormone. This is one of our gonadotropins. And that's going to be FSH. This is involved in both spermatogenesis and also oogenesis. The ovum luteinizing hormone also falls into this category. So luteinizing hormone or LH. All right, so these three are classified as glycoproteins. And so I want to talk a little bit more about the structure here and what common features each of these three different hormones are going to have. So structurally, 
Each of these consists of two subunits. Okay, so we're going to consist of two different subunits. We have an alpha and a beta subunit. I'm going to start off with the alpha subunit. The alpha subunits across these three different molecules, the thyroid stimulating hormone, FSH, and LH, they are identical amino acid sequences. Okay, so we have this alpha subunit that is identical across all three of these. In humans, it's a 92 amino acid long molecule. And then in other mammals, it's typically 96 amino acids. Okay, so that's the, the first subunit. There are two. The second one is the beta subunit. And the beta subunit is unique across the three. Okay, so the beta subunit is unique. So uh, we basically can model all three of these molecules by a model that looks similar to this. where we have the alpha subunit, which is common between all three, and the beta subunit, which we, and then they're held together. Those, um, those two subunits are held together by disulfide bridges, right? So we have cysteine, one of our residual amino acids, with sulfur, it's a sulfur-containing amino acid, and they, they come together um, to hold the beta and the alpha subunits. Yeah, the squiggles are the disulfide. Okay, so this is the basic model for all three of them. So if we kind of take this step a, a step further, basically what we end up with is okay, I'll I'll, uh, I'll just stop here and let y'all catch up before we go on to the bottom. I remember last Thursday, the last year at school, we talked about um, patient hybrid hormone versus beta and going straight to the uh, So I think that was the sex hormones or the sex steroids, um, which are, these are proteins. These are amino acid chains. And so most of these actually don't really cross the, the cell membrane because they're they are hydrophilic rather than hydrophobic, so they can't. So we do need a, re a receptor for most of these. Is everybody good? Okay, so this is the general model. This is going to be the same. Uh, the alpha subunit is going to be the same across all three. The beta subunit is what's going to be unique. And so if we kind of invert this model, basically an alpha subunit and a unique beta subunit, this, let's say, gives us LH. And then I have another molecule where the alpha subunit and the beta subunit, so I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger, that beta subunit a little bit different, this gives me TSH. Now, it turns out that if I take, let's say, this and this, this alpha subunit and this beta subunit, and I swap them, I actually still get LH, right? So as long as I have the unique beta subunit, I can take an alpha subunit from any of these others and put it in place, and I end up with the LH being preserved because it's the beta subunit that's driving uh, the function. 
And so same thing here, L subunit here, and attach that onto the beta. This would be TSH. So it's the beta subunit that's going to define not the, which hormone that we have. Okay. So uh, one of the questions you had on your quiz today dealt with um, decarboxylation. And so uh, that actually is an experiment that has been conducted. And I'd like to take a look at that experiment briefly this morning. And so in that experiment, if we decarboxylate the alpha subunit, Let me step back. This experiment is basically trying to show, okay, well then, what is the purpose of the alpha and the beta subunits? If the alpha subunit is common or the same, does it have any, does it have any purpose? So when you decarboxylate the alpha subunit, this results in an inability to bind the, re the receptor. So in part, the alpha subunit must be important for receptor binding, but the beta subunit must influence the alpha subunit's functionality so that we can bind the three different receptors for the three different hormones. So if we just decarboxylate the beta sub or the alpha subunit, we disrupt receptor binding. If we only partially decarboxylate, the alpha subunit, if we partially decarboxylate that alpha subunit, so we leave 25% of the carboxyl group, uh, functional groups intact, we actually still see receptor binding here. However, the next step in the process is typically something like adenylate cyclase activation. And with partial carboxylation, decarboxylation rather, you bind the receptor, but you do not activate adenylate cyclase. Okay, so there's our results. Now let's talk through some of the possible reasons that we observe what we observe when we decarboxylate and partially decarboxylate the alpha subunit. Okay, so explanation number one, possibility one. Possibility one is that the alpha when it interacts with the beta, it's put into proper confirmation. So that interaction, by putting in the unique beta subunit, we configure the alpha subunit differently. So we change the structural morphology of the alpha subunit dependent upon the beta subunit that gets attached. So that interaction allows for proper confirmation To be achieved. Along with this, um, this idea is that the carboxyl groups, I'm just going to call those the carbs, they're required to activate the adenylate cyclase. A second possible explanation, possibility number two, is that both the 
the alpha and the beta subunits bind the receptor collectively. And it's the beta subunit that provides the specificity. So really, this experiment gives us some explanation and some possibility as to how we can have three hormones that are basically 50% roughly identical because they have the exact same alpha subunit. But then the beta subunit, which is different, causes that alpha subunit to act differently or uh, have a different um, tertiary structure since it's a protein that allows binding of uh, the specific receptor for each of those specific So we do have a couple additional glycoproteins. I didn't include them in the first part of the list, and that's primarily because these glycoproteins are non-pituitary. But they would have the same type of structure. So they're non-pituitary, but they have the same type of structure. We just are not adding a fourth kind of beta subunit. And one of the examples that we have here is human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, which is the hormone of uh, pregnancy tests. So human chorionic gonadotropin is also a glycoprotein, has the alpha and the beta subunit, so it's the same structure, but now we have a fourth kind of beta subunit. So the beta subunit is still individually unique. All right. So our last grouping for our pituitary hormones, anterior pituitary hormones, I'm going to call this family number three. It's a complex protein, and we're actually going to pick up with lecture notes in the next chapter. And this group is the POMC group, or pro opio melano corpin derived hormones. pro opio melanocortin derived hormones. What we're basically going to find out is that we have this big gene called POMC or pro opio melanocortin, um, the pro opio melanocortin gene. And from that big long protein, we have several hormones that are included within that, within that structure. So, uh, for example, the melanotropins which in a lot of organisms will uh, deal with pigmentation patterns in the skin, and then the corticotropins, which is going to include ACTH, which is adrenaline cortical stimulating hormone or adrenal, uh, adenal corticotropin. Melanocortin. It's one big gene complex, produces one large pre pro hormone, and then from there we extract out post translationally modified and pull out individual melanotropins and corticotropins. Now that's actually what we're going to begin to talk about here in chapter number eight. So you now have everything that will be on the exam on Thursday. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start. Um, to talk through the opio 
hortons and the pars intermedia. So as soon as everybody's kind of done here with these bills, we'll go ahead and start another another set. So we could go. This is not. This is actually going to be chapter number eight out of the textbook. So we have the opio hormones. And these are a grouping of hormones that are derived from pro opio melanocortin or POM C gene. Okay. So POM C gene is a it's a big gene. And if we follow the central dogma of molecular biology, starting from DNA, which is just simply information, we will transcribe a messenger RNA molecule. The specific messenger RNA is typically just called POMC or the POMC gene. So that's our transcription, right? And then next, after messenger RNA, what do we do? We translate to protein. So we generate an amino acid sequence. Okay. So we generate the POMC gene, messenger RNA molecule. Then we translate that POMC uh, messenger RNA into a protein. And the protein is a big protein. So within that gene, we have different versions of um, MSH, which is melanocyte stimulating hormone. We're going to come back and I'm going to define all of these in a second. We're also going to find ACTH. But what's interesting about ACTH is we actually have genes within genes. And so we have an alpha version of MSH. And then we also have this protein that's called CLIP, C-L-I-P. It's going to be an acronym. We'll talk about that in just a second. And then we have a beta LPH gene. We'll talk about that in just a second, what the acronym is there. And inside of this gene, we also have a beta version, version of MSH and then a beta version of the endorphins. So there is a bunch of different, a bunch of different genes. So that's the um, the Greek letter of gamma. So you have gamma, alpha, and beta MSH. So each of these are genes within genes, right? And so the ACT gene actually has two proteins that can be extracted from it, as does LPH. So let me at least um, kind of give you the definitions here of this alphabet soup. CLIP, C-L-I-P, it's an acronym, so all the capital letters. So your MSH is, there's three of them here, those are melanocyte stimulating hormone. Melanocyte stimulating hormone. ACTH is adrenal cortical stimulating hormone. Also can be called a gene uh, adrenal cortico corticotropic hormone. The CLIP, C L I P, is 
is corticotropin like intermediate lobe peptide. This one, adrenal cortical stimulating hormone. So it stimulates the cortex of the adrenal. The next one's corticotropin like intermediate lobe peptide. Beta LPH. It's beta lipotropic hormone. Beta lipotropic hormone. And then the very last one here that we have the, the beta, beta endorphins. This is a group of hormones, the endorphins and the encephalins. And then a hormone called MET. And these are a lot of times associated with um, parasympathetic calls. So. So I'm going to just start to kind of take each of these in turn, and we'll go through a, a brief discussion over each. We're going to start off with the MSHs, the melanocyte stimulated. melanocyte stimulating hormones. So the melanocytes are specifically found. Met. So it's methionine. It, it's going to start the, the first um, the first amino acid in the sequence. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of anatomy background, hopefully you'll remember some of this. You have your five layers of the, uh, and actually they're in this picture where we don't have lucindum uh, represented, but you have the stratum corneum on the top, stratum granulosum stratum spinosum and then stratum basale. Within the basale, with projections up into the stratum spinosum, we have this group of cells that are called melanocytes. They are going to provide melanin, which is a pigment that is used in uh, skin coloration, not only in humans, but in a variety of different organisms. And a variety of different organisms can do some really interesting stuff. Humans don't really have the ability to change the same way, let's say, a chameleon does, right? And so these melanocytes are variable in terms of their function across the animal kingdom. So the melanocytes, they produce pigments that will help out with skin color changes. So starting with the epidermis, Melanocytes are the pigment containing pigment containing cells. And these particular cells have a biochemical pathway that allows the melanocyte, or sometimes referred to as the melan uh, melanophores. cells have a, a biochemical pathway that allows the amino acid tyrosine to act as a precursor molecule to a pigment called melanin. Okay, 
So tyrosine can be converted into melanin. There's many biochemical steps in this process. And so since we're talking about biochemical steps, what, what do we have involved in in this process of converting the amino acid tyrosine to the pigment melanin? We're going to have a bunch of amino acids, or uh, a bunch of enzymes. So we initiate this biochemical pathway, we turn up enzymatic reactions, begin to collect melanin in the cell. Melanin gets packed into what's called a pre-melanosome. These are subcellular packets. That's the subcellular packets. These are um, kind of like the, uh, the vesicles that carry neurotransmitters. We're going to have these subcellular packets or these vesicles, and they're going to be loaded up with this, um, with this melanin. Now, within that packet, we have a transitionary process that occurs. where the precursor molecules that are being produced are converted into melanin granules. So let me back up and explain that differently. Uh, the premelanosomes are packed up with melanin. They go through a transition. They become the melanin granules or melanosomes that we have in um, Melanocytes. So these, these little packets here that you can see inside of, these little dots that you can see inside of uh, this particular uh, melanocyte that's shown in this picture, those would be our melanosomes. They're pigment-containing packets or granules. And hopefully you'll remember that we have two different types or two main types, especially in mammals and humans, uh, of these melanin granules or melanosomes. We have two different pigments. We have eumelanin, which is a blackish or brownish color, and then we have eumelanin, which is a reddish So this is a way we can begin to modify the, uh, the concentration of eumelanin and eumelanin, and we get a variety of different uh, skin tones. Now, some organisms can do this really, really effectively, where they can change the, uh, the tone of the skin very, very quickly. P-H-O, eumelanin. Okay, so what I'd like to, oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. So what we'll talk about um, after the exam and after the break is how we actually begin to produce these melanin uh, granules in a process called melanogenesis.